In this episode, we'll dive deep into the world of passwords and the fascinating evolution of authentication. Christian, our expert, takes us on a journey through the history of passwords, their role in our digital security, the challenges we all face managing multiple accounts on a daily basis, and the birth of password managers. We'll explore the concept and importance of multi-factor authentication and a promising shift in the future towards passwordless. Plus, we'll provide some practical recommendations to enhance your organization's security posture. Don't miss this enlightening discussion on the future of authentication. I, I think we've all kind of got used to passwords over the years, but we never reuse passwords, do we guys? We never use pa more than one password for every site. We never use the same login credentials on multiple locations. And, uh, and we always make our passwords horrendously complicated so we can't remember them, don't we? So, so there are lots of advantages to passwordless. And Christian, you are our expert on this subject. So, so uh, take us through passwordless. Good. Let's take a look. But before we go to passwordless, let's have a short history of the password, maybe. And no uh, fear, I won't come here with dates and there's no test afterwards. Oh, but let's just go through it a little bit. Why do we have passwords at all? Uh, basically, because we all need some identities for different services. And we need some way to differentiate between different accounts, right? So if I have a Facebook account and you, Tony, have a Facebook account, we should somehow make it clear that I cannot post to your account without your mm -hmm. notice, at least. That's where passwords, I think, came in initially to make sure only the person who knows the password can jump into an account to a service, log into your PC or whatever. But um, yeah, as we have more and more services now, um, we need more and more accounts. And the human brain is not the best computer in that case and is not able to remember thousands of passwords or hundreds. And I'm not overestimating here. I took a look at my password manager. I'll come through that in a minute. And I have like 300 different accounts now, uh, which are accumulated over the last year. So my brain does not work like that and I cannot remember everything uh, there. So what do most people do? They have one password, they use it at multiple services maybe they are fancy and they put in an exclamation mark at the end or a one two three to differentiate a little bit but if you have a fancy person uh, knowing how you're working how your brain works then people can easily guess that password mm. and not only guess it they can also interfere with it like uh, can maybe read it and uh, see where you where you're using it and so on and to jump in there and not have to remember all those passwords. Password managers were introduced to help there. So as I said, I have a password manager, I'm using one. And with password managers, we can have several accounts, a new account for each service with a super complicated password that we don't even have to remember anymore because we can just copy and paste it, right? But how many people do you know who are really using a password? outside of the IT bubble. Yeah. I mean, okay, is this something that we've just got very bad at anyway? Because I know uh, many years ago when we all had mobile phones, or before we had mobile phones, we used to remember everybody else's telephone number. We don't do that anymore because we now have a mobile phone that remembers that stuff for us. So, yeah, so exactly. is it just because of the fact that we've got out of the habit of remembering passwords for different things? Or is it? Or do we no, just not know like that, do you think? No, I think we're not built like that because when we really want to have a good password, we need it a very long password at least. Um, even uh, the, I don't know if you remember, there was a time when even Microsoft said you have to change your password every three months to be more secure. Uh, this is officially deprecated now. The official recommendation now is have a long password that you can really remember very well. But don't change it all the time because changing passwords all the time only makes them weaker. Mm. People just add autumn 23 and then next year it will be autumn 24. Mm. Wow, what a security win, right? Um, and then the password managers came in, but nobody can use them or not everybody can yeah. use them and not everybody can use them correctly. Mm. So 
There's still a and password managers only work with um, certain things, don't they? So you may uh, you may be using uh, an, a Mac and a Windows PC and an iPhone and uh, oh I don't know uh, a, a different type of telephone. Let's say a Google P- Pixel. So you need a password manager that can deal with all of those and then all of your browsers within all of those. And it just gets, all the password yeah. managers can't keep up either with the quantity of different technology we play with. That would be the ideal world, yes. But as you know, we don't live in an ideal world. So and then you also have the argumentation that what if the password manager loses my data? Like we also had some data scandals with password managers. Uh, having data leaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't want to <laughs> say <it 'cause> <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah that's then also like i rather trust myself than i trust some random software but um i wouldn't be on that mm. side to to be honest because i'm sure there's they still work better than my brain with 300 accounts and a lot of passwords exactly and they are still encrypted and it's not so easy even if you get some vault to really get in there so they are still better than than we are but still we have the problem that Once the password is known by some malicious person, that person can easily log into that service and post in your name or order something at Amazon in your name, whatever, wherever your, your thing is. Or even worse, in Germany, we have the Elster thing, uh, the, the uh, tax thing, and uh, nobody wants to get in there uh, in another or uh, nobody wants anybody else to get in their tax system or, or something like that. So... Um, Elster, for example, they brought in a second factor that needs to be implemented. Mm -hmm. So you need to have either a secondary code that is sent to you, or you have to have um, a smart card or a certificate, anything that you have. That's the so-called second factor. And this is like the next evolution of the password journey that we are on. So you have the secret that you have, and you have something else that you can prove that you are really the person who is using the account. So what kind of second factors do you know? So, so they, then, and they're called factors, aren't they? So, so am I right in saying that the yeah. passwords are essentially knowledge factors, whereas mm -hmm. there are other factors, maybe possession factors or inheritance factors or things of that nature. So, so your, your method of providing your security is called a factor. Love that terminology. Uh, so, so yeah, obviously we all use, um, I, I have occasionally seen uh, sort of uh, little dongle things with codes on that sort of stuff. Less so these days. Now, quite often on my on my phone, we will have uh, little apps that provide passwords as well, or we'll provide passwords. And keys. then the biometric factors are also a possibility. Like, I mean, I worked at a security company beforehand, and like when we were on expos and stuff, they had like hand vein scanners and all. Kind of, I mean, that's more for, for the entrance purpose than really for logging into your Microsoft account or something, but uh, also would be a possible second factor if it was easy to scan because people are not so happy putting their eye in front of a scanner, I learned. A hand feels a lot more comfortable than putting really? your eye next to something that uh, that scans your eye. That's at least what I've heard. An eye is far more science fiction, <laughs> okay, though, isn't it? You want to you want to have you want you want to be proper science fiction and have your eye scanned if that's the case. No, but everybody uses it right now. When you use Face ID, you have your eye scanned all the time. It's not only the eye, but still your eye is scanned. Does so. it actually scan your eye as part um, of that process? I assumed it just measured distances between the various components. It's it's the distance. It's all the face and uh, but also the blood veins. I think uh, are also part of it. So. Uh, it's very sophisticated stuff. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so mm. there are a lot of lot of secondary factors. Uh, I'm very glad you didn't mention uh, text message as one of the factors or email because that is a big no no nowadays. They can be uh, interfered with very very easy. They can be uh, caught and used as the next mm. problem. Um, man in the middle or machine in the middle attack as it nowadays called because. The attackers also evolved with our password journey, right? We have passwords, second factor. The attacker says, oh, shit. Um, now one has to prove you have the password and some kind of dongle or whatever. But hey, let's just uh, tell the user that we are the service that they want to use. So attackers set up some machines, some middle services. There are even frameworks for that to... Um, 
to show a website that is really, really looking closer to the original service they want to use. And then they ask for the second factor and the user yeah, puts in a hey, great, my password. It asks for my second factor. Perfect. It's me. Let's go. And the attacker then says, oh, thank you very much. Um, just has to be very fast and then log into the original service with your own provided secondary factor. So now it's still better. It still solves 98% of all the problems with password um, manipulation and so on. Um, but still the attackers caught up mm. there and they are catching up more and more. So then uh, there was the next step. There was an alliance found in, founded in, I think, uh, no, no years. Who yeah, glad no I don't do have years. to say no, no years. years. Uh, I'm a can I just I don't, clarify as well? I don't do years. Can I just clarify as well? So, yeah. so when it comes to passwords we're using at the moment, this this whole element of doing base or biometrics or what have you, that that is classed as multi-factor authentication. Because I think the whole thing is exactly. we get people get confused between passwordless and multi-factor authentication. And they are slightly different, but also linked, just to make life confusing. Absolutely. As it's always, uh, the more confusing, the mm. better. Yeah, that is. That's IT. It seems. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, that's IT. Um, yes, but but you are absolutely right. We are talking multi-factor authentication at the moment, and we are still on the way to our passwordless solution. Um, some years ago, very or large organizations like Google, Microsoft, Apple, um, I think Intel, and very, very many organizations, they came together and founded an organization called the FIDO Alliance. FIDO, F-I-D-O, for Fast Identity Online, with the goal to provide a logon me mechanism which doesn't rely on passwords. And they found a way to do that. And as it turns out, it's based on a very old and very secure scheme that is used in IT very, very often. It's public and private key partnership. So to break that down very, very, um, or cut that, to uh, try to make it a little bit easy to understand, basically it is something um, that is on a secure device, for example, such a security key here that comes in different sizes and oh, forms. Um, uh, something there um, has some secret private information and a service that we want to use, like an identity provider, let's say Azure ID, Entra ID, as it's nowadays called, or uh, Google or Apple, they only will then have a public part a public key that is only matching and only working with that single private one that we have on that device. And every time we want to log on, we say, hey, I'm Christian, I want to log on. And the service knows, okay, there is a device that is linked to me, to my service, and sends out a little challenge. And this little challenge will be solved by that security hardware. and encrypted with the private key part and mm. as again this private part is only on that single one device and when it's encrypted with that one and the service has the public part of that the service then can decrypt the answer from the security service from from uh, from the hardware and this is the way the service absolutely can guarantee that the request that got in there is from the person with this one single security yeah. device. Can't the device therefore be taken though? Well, obviously we're limiting then to the device that they've got. So for example, uh, yeah. if you've got a laptop, you are authenticating the laptop because of the physical device. Uh, does that mean that somebody could steal your dongle for want of a better expression? What's it called these days? It can't be called a dongle, can it? It, it really, it really depends. Yeah, they they can be stolen, mm. um, but oftentimes they still need a secondary um, uh, option to answer that request. Yeah. So let's say with that dongle, for example, if you see this small part here, this is always asking for a oh, press. I so I have to press yeah. this to answer the challenge that the service gives us or i have to even put in a, a, a pin code or when you do it on a mobile phone you have to get your bi biometrics for example so even if you let this 
plugged in in your device um, and the service asks for a request, it will not do the answer automatically. You have to do it. Um, still can be stolen, yes, but if you have that pin code for it, that would have to be stolen yeah. also, or people would have to so know that. It is multi-factor is, in that respect, and the fact that it's two, two triggers. It at least. is multi-factor in that respect, exactly. And the cool thing is there are those little devices, but there are also implementations now, for example, in Windows, called Windows Hello for Business, where the Windows device itself forms as this second security factor. But to get into that device, you have to either also have to put in a pin or your biometrics, your face, your fingerprint or whatever. So this way, your Windows device can also work as your second security yeah. factor. Oh, nice. So this is, I think, where we were um, on a passwordless solution and passwordless now because we don't even need to put in a password anymore. The only thing we need to do is plug in that little stick, uh, get in our security pin code two or, or of six or eight digits maybe and then everything is going on automatically this was the case i think before or until like one and a half years ago one year ago and some vendors already implemented that and it helps absolutely but it's not mass friendly i would say it's still hard to tell my brothers who are not completely in IT to use such extra stick and then you lose it So and, mm. and uh, what happens then, okay? It's more secure, but it's also adding complexity there. And this is only on the personal side. In, if we are in a company environment, there are even more challenges, much more challenges um, that uh, you have to provide or you, when, when you have to provide all those security sticks or authenticator apps yeah. and so on. And you've got to bind them to specific um, people and then manage that binding and all this sort of business. So, so everything is unique. Exactly. To which is more administration. Yes. May, I don't know. It's more administration. I don't know if you uh, remember those RSA sticks from like 15 yeah. years ago. They were basically a part of that, at least for the second factor thing. But it was hell to yeah. manage them. So I remember, I remember going so back to the days where we used to have to plug a dongle in to be able to use a, a, a serial dongle to be able to use specific software. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. so yeah, yeah, still in, still in use nowadays. Mm. By the way, still in use. There are actually serial to USB adapters for multiple software dongles. Oh. I'm not making this <laughs> up. Okay. <laughs> so if you want to implement such a Fido or passwordless solution in a broad scale in a company, you have to really make a plan for it. It's nothing that you can just on the on a flip switch turn on. You have to plan, you have to do a rollout, you have to educate your help desk, you have to educate your IT, um, you have to have backup plans and so on. It's a big project. It can make your organization way mm. more secure. Okay. That's very, very important. It can make it really, really secure. Yeah. But but again, I was going to say, the, so, so the key, there are advantages to doing this sort of approach from, from the point of view of what passwords can be beaten by. I, mean, I, was, I was doing some digging on, on, on what passwords, what passwordless fixes. So things like um, key loggers. So it's essentially a common method of being able to gather, gather password data is by logging the keyboard of the person who's accessing the data so that you can define usernames, passwords, and uh, utilize those for yourself. Man in the middle attacks, they're essentially immune to man in the, mid man in the middle attacks because the fact Ow. that uh, you never know what information you're going to be getting. Credential stuffing, <whistles> love that. It's, uh, you know, sort of like, I don't know, uh, pork and stuffing. But, uh, but credential stuffing, essentially <laughs> what that means is, is where, whereby you're reusing the same passwords and usernames for multiple sites. Then, uh, then people can grab the, grab the credentials from one site and use it on others. And my personal favorite is brute force attacks. And I don't know whether the guys who create brute force attacks software uh, have a sense of humor or not, but I got a list of brute force attacks software. And this can be used by anybody. You don't need to be a hacker to be able to do a brute force attack. It's like freely available these days. There's one called Hashcat, which sounds quite cool. Another one called THC Hydra. Uh, it sounds like some sort of Japanese superhero. But my personal favorite was there's one called Dave Grohl. 
lead singer of the Foo Fighters. I don't know whether he wrote the hacking software, but, but <laughs> there's a Dave Grohl brute force tool for Mac OS X. So, so, but I think all of these things, by utilizing passwordless, you bypass all of those as being a, as being a common attack method. Exactly. And you won't ever send a password over the wire again mm. because there is simply no password that can be grabbed somewhere. So it's it's really, really good um, if you are an organization and somehow responsible for IT and security. Take a look at that. There are several steps to go, but it really, really helps. And even if you don't go the, the FIDO route yet, which is completely passwordless, We do actually still primarily, the primary way in which, which anybody gets into their business network is via a password. But that, what that means is yes. that all of the ransomware attackers out there are really just tuned up to try and capture passwords. That's, that's, their, that's their job or their primary job. If they came onto your network and found there were exactly. no passwords to be able to mess with, would they essentially give up because would there's no method of gaining access without you know, any good uh, to be able yeah, to mess they, with? Someone, I hope they would give up. I think they would still uh, look around and around and try to go uh, and see where the small misconfiguration is. Because as you know, an attacker only needs one small misconfiguration and the uh, defender needs to defend everything. So it's always a cat and mouse game there. But uh, it would make it way, way harder, at least the initial access. And this is what is important. The initial access nowadays is way too yeah. easy for the most organizations because they don't have multi-factor um, uh, authentication active or user risk-based authentication methods like uh, for example let's say lisa is working in nuremberg all the time and suddenly she logs in from brazil then this is something that is strange could be okay mm -hmm. could she could be on holiday right but it and the systems don't know that directly yeah. So her, her user risk could rise and an automated system could then say, hey, Lisa, that's great. Do you want to log on? But you're not in your usual location. You have to provide your second factor. Yeah. And this is also something that really, really can help increase the security. So this is, and that's what, adaptive authentication? That is that the name for that? That's one term to use it, exactly. But the, but the idea being, yeah. and, I, and I think it's a, it's a common thing in the fact that People always take the easiest route. So, so essentially, the reason that people have the same password for everything is because it's easier to have the same password for everything. Uh, because we, uh, we're, we're thinking of simplicity rather than security as our default. And it's the same thing with, with that sort of authentication. If, if, if it's really easy for them to log on in their normal way, and then there's the occasional time where they have to make it a little bit more complicated because you've logged on from a different location or a different computer or a different time zone, then 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 great. Most people will accept that. It's when they have to log on with two-factor authentication or three-factor authentication every time they have to log on. Then, then, then you'll get situations where people are just, I don't know, trying to find ways around it, leaving their machines logged in, something else on those lines whereby they just don't want to actually constantly go through the trial of making it difficult for themselves yeah. and uh, then even when you work with something like a smartphone app or so where it gives you push notification for as a second factor they someone just still so gets so used to it that an attacker just tries and tries and tries and someone the people will say yeah okay then log in that might be some back-end service mm -hmm. i don't know and then the attacker is in again And with those FIDO things, we just don't have that problem. And it's not that you need uh, one stick for every service. You can use some uh, one stick for multiple services. Uh, so it's it's really, really easy to use. But again, you have to have that stick. Mm. And now let's jump into our history a little bit again. One and a half years or so ago, um, maybe even earlier, Uh, the large organization started to work on something that is called Passkey. Uh, and a Passkey is an, a software-based implementation of those security sticks. And they did this so that you can have that basically on your iPhone, on your Android phone, on your Windows or Mac PC. And if you want, you can even sync that small secure blob in the vendor's cloud system. So let's say, for example, mm -hmm. Apple, you create a passkey on your iPhone. This is a direct relation between your 
iPhone and the service that you're using, but you want to be able to log in on your Mac also, yeah. right? Then you can put that passkey into your iCloud or Keychain, I think is the name, and it will automatically sync to your Mac device that is also um, configured for your iCloud. And then when you log into the service in your browser, it will say, it will see, ah, oh, there's a passkey. I can just push that in. You don't have to type in a password or something. It will automatically work. So it's following. So we've gone from the point whereby with the dongle, it's you're authenticating a physical device with a soft key. You're essentially authenticating the person because no matter which device that person is logging into or uh, owns, then it'll work on your iPad, it'll work on your Mac, it'll work on your uh, on your iPhone. Maybe, maybe even on your Windows and machine if you can download it to that. Not yet directly. There are password maybe, managers yes. coming in again who can help there. Um, but yeah, ex essentially, it's exactly that. You can transfer your super secure blob and because you have to um, log in to your macOS device or to your iPhone with fingerprint or whatever it's still made secure that only you can mm -hmm. use it i want it to be called blob there. is that right can we can we just change the name to blob i, I don't, don't uh, right? there, there are many blobs yeah. in it i don't know if that is also mm -hmm. called a blob it just, I just it's just a good word it's a perfect it's name just, just a good word yeah yes <laughs> exactly um so it's getting way better it's getting way more understandable for quote unquote normal users um because they don't have to carry anything around they always uh, already have their devices and um, it's it's way easier and we still have that one-to-one -one, um, relationship between the service and you mm -hmm. basically so one caveat though if you have a shared device and you put your passkey there everybody else on that device can yeah. also use it But still, I think that is um, not the, the normal use case for most of the and devices. I th and I think this is where biometrics are probably the way to go, aren't they? I mean, we've, we've had fingerprint readers for a while, and they're pretty good. We're, we're using a lot more face ID stuff these days, and, and I think that's even better than maybe fingerprints are. But and I'm sure that I'm sure that the that a uh, that a very clever and very dedicated team of attackers will be able to get around it because that's just the way life is. Uh, but for 99% of the time, it's good enough. And I think at the moment, passwords just aren't good enough. Not not in passwords any way, shape or are... form. So, so it's a huge leap yeah. in the right direction if we can go down that road. And also like with the rise of quantum computing, a password is also getting uh, even more problems, I think. Mm. So it's interesting to see that shift now uh, going to, to password less. But how is it with yeah. the encryption of that uh, key? So would that be something mm -hmm. that's going to be a problem? Because it feels like we are having a digital key again that could be stolen and maybe it feels a little mm -hmm. bit like a step back from the from the hardware key. How is that uh, going? Yeah, so the large vendors, uh, or you can decide if the pass key should stay on that single device or it should be included in your iCloud or Google account or whatever. Um, Apple and Google and also Microsoft both uh, all um, agreed and made publicly that or made public that they will not be able to access those information or that information because it will be end-to-end -end encrypted with a, um, a secret that is on your devices only. So they won't be able to read it. Interesting. That is the the idea, and they. May, Yeah, that's their suggestion, their uh, promise to do so. I think, again, for 99%, that's totally fine. If you don't want that, you can still have those passkeys on your single devices. You would just have to create a new passkey on each device. Would still work. Technically, the same thing. You, It would automatically lock you in. Um, And it's not only those three services, it's PayPal now, it's uh, Nintendo, uh, for example, uh, adopted passkeys. And I think uh, within the next two, three months, we will see many, many services jump in there because it's an open library, can mm -hmm. be easily implemented, and it makes things so much faster and uh, also easier for the users um, while still increasing security yeah. enormously. And with quantum computing, Lisa, is your point the fact that from the point of view of cracking passwords, 
uh, and therefore yeah, cracking, exactly. uh, you know, even even quite complicated keys becomes infinitely more doable. I remember years ago, um, they, they would sort of say, oh yeah, 128-bit key, it will take something like 10 years to crack it or something else along those lines. These days, it's nothing like that. I don't know, is there a timeline on how long it takes to crack a 128-bit key? Yeah, there are some web services um, telling you that. And um, it's uh, I, al I always get shocked when I see the numbers because you, there's so much power, so much CPU power nowadays in those all public yeah. cloud things that it's really, really yeah, easy to exactly. do. So still some some decryption methods or encryption methods uh, will take years, but with quantum, the possibilities are rising there yeah. very, very it's, it's fast. It's that better, doesn't it? I think for some reason. I don't claim yeah. to understand quantum. And again, without any password, no password cracking. Very true. So yeah, if there's a company out there who listens to us now and thinks Christian has a point, are there a few recommendations you can give them what they can do or what they maybe should make sure? I mean, you said it's not something you do overnight. It's not like super easy and uh, from one day to another you switch the method, but uh, maybe you can give some suggestions, some experiences you have made to the listeners to just have some advice there. Start with the admin accounts. Yeah. If your admin accounts are somehow hacked, your whole company is. And uh, oftentimes we still see admin accounts from classic on-premises environments being synchronized with Azure AD, for example. Um, that is a no-no. Don't do that. Please use separated accounts and enforce multi-factor authentication in the online world, at yeah. least there. Admin accounts first, do that. And if it costs some money, pay it. It will save you so much. Yeah, sorry. Lisa. Uh, yeah, and don't give ev everybody an admin account. That's also something <laughs> we see that's just, yeah, yes. it's admin. Uh, you, you need some permissions. Okay, here's your admin account. Please don't do that. So first check if no. the people really need the admin account and then uh, just do what Christian says. And all the cloud providers, all, it doesn't matter if it's Google or AWS, Amazon, um, which is AWS or Microsoft, they all have roles that can be used. So even if you give out an admin account, make sure you only give those permissions that are really mm. needed. Global admin is something for the safe and for one person or at all, at yep. maximum, okay? Everything else should be done via dedicated administrator accounts, which are very, very closely targeted to what they should be doing. Yep. It's, to be fair, I, you, it's more administration doing all that sort of stuff. It's more administration tying it all down. But I think these in this day and age, you well, there's no there's no excuse for not doing it, I suppose. But more importantly, it is it is you've got to expect that nasty people are going to get onto your network because there are so many methods by which they can do it. So therefore, you have to do it. And I think uh, it's it's your the last line of defense. And uh, something that, that's, that's really important in the way that life works at the moment. And I, and I also and again, I, would, I would go one step further and say, I, if, you, if there's any possibility, also separate your networks into various things as well. So, so that if, you know, between different sites, try and have different admin account systems for different sites. So you don't. So when you lose one site to a ransomware attack, you don't immediately lose all of your sites because the, the tendency is always to have one network that covers your business. And actually, that again is less secure to do so. But mm, more more administration, but better protection. Absolutely. And again, ninety eight percent of all the attacks could have been solved or at least blocked with multi factor authentication turned on. So please, please mm. do that. Interesting. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Christian. That's useful information. So thanks very much, and thanks, Lisa. Thanks everyone for listening. Hope you found our discussion useful and that remember to try using passkeys on your personal account. They may well be the future of authentication. Please don't forget to subscribe. We'll do an episode once every two weeks. And if you have any subjects you'd like us to discuss, please just leave a comment. Thanks for watching. <laughs>